Good morning, good afternoon, or good night, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, my name is Alejandra, and we want to welcome you to our return episode of The X Button. So, like I mentioned, my name is Alejandra, and with me, it's always my lovely uh, partner in crime. Oh, this is Paul. Happy quarantine, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Paul, um, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> coming at you today with your apocalyptic radio yes <laughs> it is it, it, it almost feels like we should do like a fallout s- special or something because <laughs> that's how it literally feels around, at, at this point <laughs> so yeah so paul uh, so for everyone that probably noticed that this is finally going back in their feeds and all that um it's been a long time since we actually uploaded stuff um actually the last time me and paul spoke was back in march 30th at least Can you believe that? Spoke. <laughs> yeah, it's basically spoke. Yeah. Obviously, there's been texting and all that, but the last time I got to hear his uh, radio voice was literally <laughs> a month and a half, I think At we least. can say. It's, yeah, because today's May 14th. Yeah, today's May 14th. We're already halfway through May. Can you believe that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> By tomorrow. Dude, I get married in six months. <laughs> yeah, and I'm surprised that you're still on track with that, considering everything around. The world is basically delayed and canceled. Oh, we've <laughs> we've confirmed that even if we have to cancel or like push back the actual celebration, we're getting married on that day one way or another. If we have to just like sign a piece of paper with two people standing next to us, we're going to get it happen. I mean, you can always do a Zoom wedding. I mean, those are a thing. I've now. heard. And it's apparently <laughs> in Colorado, you could just like show up and sign things. You can go into the park or go hiking together and have it happen like you don't need witnesses yeah so i was like we're gonna figure it out (laughs) look with this kind of pandemic that we're still living here even though finally some places are starting to get into the into a group of probably reopening i don't know if they're reopening where you are or still thinking about it Um, some places have um open areas like we have a the lakefront at our area it's a really long stretch a really nice uh, place to cook out and hang out on the weekends they close it down but mm-hmm. during the week they can't really stop anyone from going out there so um fortunately new orleans the greater new orleans area has like a lot of really great um like parks places you can go into and like still be social distancing mm-hmm. um and that's really helped for like at least my mental sanity but i've also realized how much of an introvert i've become and i have absolutely loved not having to see people or go anywhere my fiance has hated it um but alejandro tell me because i have heard some rough stuff going on um, yeah on the side yeah, so it's a good thing that you at least have a couple of places to go to, at least to walk outside and practice social distancing. Mm-hmm. Down here, we can't even get out of our house unless we uh, have a very specific day based on what our last number of our ID is to just okay. go get, yeah, to just go get uh, groceries or go to the pharmacy. Other than that, no can do you, like we can't go outside uh and practice social distancing not at all it's like they um they're trying the hardest here to try to curb infections and it's reaching to the point where people are getting desperate because they literally have when this started was like march 21st around that time when the full lockdown started and then my country locked down, which by the way, it's El Salvador for people to know. Mm. Um, our country closed down on the 11th, but then stay at home started on the 21st. That was going to be a month. Mm-hmm. Then halfway through that time, we got added another 15 days. And then by the time where we arrived to the date we could have ended originally, which yep. was April 21st, they added an extra 15 days. Mm-hmm. And then by the time that we reached like May 1st, uh, they were talking about adding a couple extra days. And then by the time we were on March 7th, they started a new 15 day countdown where they added these extra lockdown procedures. And I am an introvert kind of like you, even though people think I'm an extrovert. Yeah. Uh, I need that balance. I love talking with people sometimes, mm-hmm. probably a lot of times, but I reached a point where I can't always be socializing. So th- this was a little bit of a blessing at, at a certain point, yeah. but cabin fever is not a blessing. I tell you that. So 
I am really hoping that by March 20, um, I mean, May 22nd, we probably have like an idea of how we can at least go out and practice social distancing because this virus is here to stay. Yeah. Like this is part, this is part of now, us. This, this is our, thing. yeah, this is our cordyceps. Like, <laughs> like this, this is a little last of us reference there. Like it's just part of what it is and we have to adapt. And just by being in lockdown, it's just not going to do it. So, but it's a good thing. Like that really weighed on me in that month that we didn't do this show for a little bit, but I think enough stuff is happening back in the game, in the gaming world that I think it's worth to use this as, as a distraction again, not just for us, but for probably the 10, 12 people that are listening to us too. Yeah. So, so yeah, Paul, um, it's been a month and a half in that time. What have you been playing, seeing or hearing? My dude, I have been doing so much, uh, at least in that realm. As far as I'm going to start with seeing, because I'll just burn through it quickly. Um, mm-hmm. I watched through the entirety of The Good Place uh, mm-hmm. with my all the most of these with my fiance. I've watched through. Um, uh, wasn't Community, it wasn't Parks and Rec. Uh, New Girl, we finished that. Um, and we started watching Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. We're in the last season of that. Um, knocking it out of the park and then i started another show on netflix called kingdom now have you heard of kingdom alejandro uh, the walking dead ish show yeah you could yeah. F- heavily simplify it yeah mm-hmm. um yeah. it's korean made for anybody listening and it's basically in feudal korea during that time period and um like they're king basically uh he passes away and they find an herb that can supposedly bring the dead back to life well that naturally doesn't go well and um it, like he bites one of the hand servants who then su- manages i won't spoil it but they manage to kind of spread it and as the outbreak is happening the crown prince who's the main character of the story is in the middle of a power struggle and that's really where like the story is that the queen is trying to take over control of the kingdom from him and he's trying to get all of his people back stop this outbreak and save his kingdom at the same time and survive it basically and um it has been some of the hardest core stuff that i've seen because like i mean Korean shows they don't focus too much on the melodrama. Okay, let's that's not true. If it's a show about melodrama, they focus heavily on it. Yeah, I was but gonna say that's pretty much that, the Asian thing. <laughs> it's not like it's not supposed to be just like a heavy like people looking at each other and passionately yelling and whatnot. Um, it's not like Walking Dead in that aspect. I mean, where it's not about like the issues between each person and all their little motivations and stupidities. It's really about like this king, this prince needs to like get stuff going, and so it's usually like they're trying to travel to this one area. They've come across a city that needs help. They basically save the city with the uh, the prince's like ingenuity or using some kind of new creative way to fight these undead. Um, and of course the action is freaking awesome because they all have their katanas, uh, their spears and every different thing, because I guess it's not really a samurai sword because that was Japanese, but they do, uh, mention that they're fighting the Japanese at this time. So there's an invading country in their country right now that is also dealing with zombies and, um, it's just freaking crazy right now and I'm loving it. There's only two it's, seasons. Yeah, it's in my queue. So I've been wait. I, I I think I've said it before, um, in an old show. Probably I don't know, but I work on moods, so I'm the, I have to be in the right mood to like start a new show. I especially right now, uh, especially right now with uh, this pandemic, I've been like, it's been rare for me to like venture off my beaten path and try to and try something new. Like literally, the newest thing that I tried before this happened was Shadow Hunters. Like I mentioned, oh yeah, three or four episodes ago. That, didn't you? Oh yeah, and I loved it. <laughs> and you got noticed by what was it? One of the ath- one of the actresses that I, 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 she, she she was doing like a live um, a live t- uh, a live tweeting of a rewatch of the finale, and I asked a question and she answered it, which by the way has been happening a lot. This uh, this break, I've yeah, been like tweeting to a lot of like yeah yeah I've been like. Being able to like chat a little bit with some actors and 
even directors, which has been really cool because oh, they know it, man. They, <laughs> yeah. just, they sense it. Real recognizes real. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so I, I finished Arrow again because the last episode that we recorded, you I think I was, it, yeah, yeah, I was nearing the end, and, and you the were ending it a lot more. Oh yeah, and the ending hit me harder. Get, uh, thinking about like everything so fresh in my mind. So, in fact, um, curse me for this. I actually restarted it because that's my workout show now. Because, <laughs> hmm. really, yeah, like, yeah. So, like, if I'm working out, I want to. I put it like it's like now my workout show because I know how long episodes are, what happens in some, and I time my workouts to that. That helps really? me kind of like pass the pass the time. I can't do a new show when I'm working out. Because I kind of get de- de- desperate, so so I, I kind of like relegated to that. Um, I did f- watch all six seasons of Community, which kind of like dropped into Netflix in between this long hiatus we had. Uh, comfort show for me, it's such such a funny, clever show, uh, man. <laughs> then and then uh, I did watch a couple episodes of Lucifer, which is the. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, because that's a DC show for people that yeah, don't know. It's a comic um, that a lot of people didn't realize when it came. Yeah, out. from from Vertigo, from the from DC's old Vertigo imprint, um, mm-hmm. and also because he uh, was part of the crossover that I was always mentioned in all of our previous shows. That I'm gonna try to not say the name at this point because it's, a, it's such a joke at this point. Um, <laughs> I um, so I watched the first season and kind of stopped after that. Uh, I did watch all of Westworld season three, oh. which I still um, I still stand that I think that show is more disappointment than great. Like it really, I, I, it never feels like that show um, clicks for me. And I've given it three seasons now, and because people were praising this new season for me so much, and I was like, I didn't like season two, but okay, I'm gonna give this one a shot, especially because it's eight episodes this time Mm -hmm. instead of 10 so i was like okay this is going to be quicker and there's one episode that's really excellent and then the rest just kind of falls apart i'm like yeah i think that's it for me can't do westworld Mm -hmm. (laughs) i I really can't respect to like understand what you're willing to deal with and you're being being willing to walk away from it yeah it's like i feel i was ready to walk away from it after two but i had so many friends be like you have to try it and i'm like okay and didn't happen so that's been the extent of what i've been watching recently right. but what have you and just real quick and listening um uh, the inside of you podcast from michael rosenbaum um uh-huh. where he interviews like a bunch of actors and all that but the oh, more yeah, the one you were mentioning yeah that i mentioned last time and what i appreciate about that show is how they talk about mental health and struggle they don't really mm-hmm. talk about projects as much they kind of mention it but that's not kind of like the point and it's so cool seeing people be open about how hard life can be and and that has been a little cathartic whenever i'm feeling a little down because i know i'm not the only one and you hear that from like people that i've seen in many shows mm-hmm. like from and i remember you saw the, the huge list that i uh that I showed that I showed you the kind of people that guess in yeah. the show, and it was and, a really uh, nice stacked list too. Yeah, a lot of the really cool people have guests on the show, and then you learn so much about it. So I that's kind of have been my go to listening podcast when I'm not listening to my usual daily gaming podcasts, which I haven't been listening to much. I've kind of cut down to just like a few because why not there's not much to talk about or there wasn't much to talk about here but paul what have you been playing okay um i last thing i'd forgot on see uh seeing was the clone wars wrapping up finish that i forgot about mentioning that yeah completely forgot about it i think um short version is uh the first four episodes were good classic basic clone wars um, middle four or three or four episodes didn't need to exist. And the last four were absolutely phenomenal. I'll say this, uh, because I've been seeing this being floating around. It feels like Dave Filoni only wanted to do those last four episodes. And Disney yeah. and Disney didn't want to allow him to do just that. What they wanted was to sell another season for right. uh, Disney+. Plus. And when you think about it that way, it makes sense because those last four episodes really stand alone. Like that oh, middle yeah. arc literally didn't need to exist. And when they even yeah. try to ref, they, when they literally try to uh, 
reference it in the in 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 those four episodes. Literally, Ahsoka says something like, "Yeah, that's not a, that's not a story worth telling you right now." I'm like, "Right, oh, thank you for wasting four weeks of this." And um, I honestly and then, thought it would like come back to play. Like, are they gonna are the mm-hmm. sisters gonna come in and save her? No, exactly. Just... Yeah, but not not at all. So I think that lays it bare that those first eight episodes only existed just for Disney to say mm-hmm. the final season instead of being like, come watch the final movie. I think a final season sounds better in marketing, especially with yeah. the uh, with how notorious it was that the Clone Wars ended because it was canceled. It didn't end on its own terms. Like, by Disney. Well, <laughs> exactly, by Disney because they wanted their own show with yeah. Rebels, which was good, but not like Clone eh, Wars. Yeah. Um, and then I the gotta bad... say though, um, can you just imagine if you hadn't seen Rebels and know the fate of the characters, how much on the edge of your seat would you have been? Because I like forgot at times during the last episode uh-huh. where I'm like, oh, what is gonna go down? Like she's running on these. Th- uh-huh. I can't spoil it, but um, just and the three characters are free falling and they're free falling and all of that. Um, yeah. I'm just sitting here like, oh my gosh, what is going down? Um, just to know like what would end up happening was it almost like it did add like a bitter sweetness to it mm-hmm. to know that like this is almost the beginning of her journey, not the end at all. Exactly, yeah. And I feel it's almost classic Star Wars in a way because when you were watching the prequels, you already knew what was going to happen That's with the true. original trilogy. So ironically, it's like, they were faced in that same way, but you could only imagine um, the scenario where we wouldn't have known. But oh, yeah. even without knowing, I would say like the level of tension that those episodes had, like you, they felt powerful. They mm-hmm. felt potent. Like those four episodes literally made that final season worth it. Like by the time that I was by episode eight, I was like, this season has been a huge disappointment to me. I was like, it's not because it didn't feel as like after waiting for it for basically six years because season six on Netflix was in 2014. It was like, man, have we waited six years for this? This is what they're giving us. Yeah. But I knew last- there was going to be like more to it, but yeah. it was like I had a feeling I was slogging through mud to be like, all right, I'm going to find the gold somewhere in here. Let's go. <laughs> but do you want it to be like slogging through mud to find the gold instead oh, of just no, receiving the gold? All, exactly. But- so. That's how they felt reaching those final four, but that was worth it. And I literally tell people that it literally is just worth it to just jump to those four. Like yeah. if they're if they're curious, like the Bad Batch arc literally was just put there because that was the most completed arc that they had back when they like I wouldn't say completed, but it was like halfway through completion, and it was easier for them to pick up and just put it there. Uh, Which I can understand it. Like if they need content, like if I was the dave filoni i'd be like well we got this one that's mostly finished and it's self-contained might as well throw mm-hmm. that one in there exactly yeah <laughs> and it sense and it sucks that we're never gonna see how darth maul escaped from sidious because that became a comic book that was one of those arcs that oh yeah that's true they had they had the sketches they had like the scripts all of it ready but because of the cancellation they couldn't complete them so they sent them to comic book forms uh, that would have been a really cool one to for this, like, let's say, had this season had not been 12 episodes, but the fact that they were 12 just goes to show you that they really were in it for the Siege of Mandalore. Mm-hmm. And it was as great a finale as that show could have ever received. And those fights with Darth Maul, with now the motion capture with by Ray, Ray Park, Park. Oh, that yeah. Was, what a difference that made. Like, that I felt was. It. Yes. So, it was, like, what are achievement in animation that show has been like considering how ugly mm-hmm. cartoon squared it was if, back if you start like from the movie and then just watch this final arc just oh, the man. night and day whiplash you will get because i saw like they were the i was watching like one of the youtubers they were kind of showing some clips of the original stuff and then like cutting straight to the new and mm-hmm. i swear i got whiplash seeing that but it it's was insane. such a satisfying feeling. Yeah. The animation turn happened by season three around that time because that's when they did the yeah. new and the new models and all that. But yeah, that show just kept getting progressively Better. beautiful. And that's where Rebels missed for me because um the they didn't put the style, I 
said. So. Yeah, the yeah the style remained a little bit more consistent, but apparently from what I hear, and I was reading, that was because uh, Clone Wars, when it was under George Lucas, he put unlimited money towards it. He actually admitted that Clone Wars actually made him lose money, but he didn't care because he wanted those stories told. And it was George Lucas, and he has a lot of money he could throw away if you if you need it to. And Disney didn't want to put as much money towards Rebels because Disney is all about profits. So that's why yeah. the animation quality is lesser. You know, that makes sense. And that's probably why they had to change the style to something far more simple in the first place. Because mm-hmm. that's like what better way to work with a smaller budget than to make a simplified art style where you have less moving. Exactly. And obviously that show ended way sooner because uh, Dave Filoni wanted to end it because he didn't want to be put in a position like Clone Wars. He was wanting to go until season eight. That was his plan, and he got undercut severely. So Revels was like, yeah, we're capping it at four so that we can say that we completed the story. And I can feel that. It sucks when you watch something and it's not complete. Or you yeah. know it could have been complete. So That's, okay, uh, I get that feeling whenever I watch uh, Rise of Skywalker, honestly. But we're not going to go into that. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, did you rewatch it when it hit Disney Plus? I did, I did actually just recently uh, with my parents because my parents had not watched Rise of Skywalker and I made it that way. Yeah. Um, they were just kind of like, oh, yeah, the new Star Wars movie came out. I was like, yeah, it was kind of eh, just wait till it comes out. We'll, okay, we'll okay. Watch it together. I finally reached the point where my opinion finally turned. I hate eight and nine and I wish those movies didn't exist. Really? So moving. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, moving man, on. You can't just drop a bombshell on yeah. us like that. <laughs> All right. We'll talk yeah. about that later. Maybe we can later. chat about it in another episode. Exactly. Yeah. I just I'm, I'm kind of done. So, yeah. Paul, I feel so but Dave his, Filoni coming yeah, back again. Da- Absolutely. And real quick, do you see his explanation of the Duel of the Fates? Just I real did. Quick? I saw that one clip and I'm so happy. <laughs> he Just, should be the mastermind going forward. He really should. Just, um, yeah. For context to anybody listening, just go watch the docuseries on Disney Plus about the Mandalorian. Uh, Dave Filoni briefly talks about the Duel of the Fates fight with Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, and Darth Maul and how that is a tie-in to basically the importance of the whole rest of the prequels and why it is still important like thematically and plot wise um to like all the prequels as well but uh, that's context for y'all absolutely so okay paul we we dwell in what i've been watching for a little bit but it's been a month and a half so we watch a lot it has um what have you been playing playing i have gone into a bit of a from software binge honestly um so i started off let me see i was going through and playing bloodborne Mm -hmm. from start to finish made a whole new character did everything um just maxed out my strength really tried to focus on having fun and i was curb stomping pretty much everything because i had beaten it already once and i was also in the middle of like a new game plus playthrough before Mm -hmm. i quit the game um so i honestly i still haven't really finished it but i have made it very far i delved into like a lot of lore videos because i Mm -hmm. missed out on that and um i learned a lot about the world of bloodborne and it is fantastic the kind of stuff and i was eating every ounce of it up um yeah. the details and all what are you saying and no, yeah i agree with that like there's just something so special about that world like more than any other Very. from software mm-hmm. yeah probably the only other one that felt like that was the first dark souls but Bloodborne just feels special. It's like a Castlevania game almost. Oh, yeah. Like, it, very and, Castlevania, a mix of the HP Lovecraft idea, that whole mm-hmm. like power corrupts absolutely, and just to see like what happened. Environmental storytelling. That yeah. is the pinnacle of show, don't tell, and I love how much I feel it when I walk into that city. Still to this day, the only From Software Souls game I've beaten. Till this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else um yes so that was the start of the binge and i'm on the second phase of it because uh i loaned this game to a friend of mine who finished it i honestly thought he was going to get too frustrated and he would give up so when he beat it i went oh no i gotta go back and beat this myself now or i'm gonna look like an idiot (laughs) and so i put sekiro into my system 
and I, I told myself I was going to learn the mechanics of that game if it killed me. <laughs> and I did. I It finally clicked after a few bosses. I had to, like, basically go back to the original part of the game. Like, I still had my save, but I went to the first area and went through all the easy people, like, working my way up. Like, oh, yeah, that's how this played. Oh, that's how that worked. And um, at some point, just the, the mechanic of deflecting finally clicked in my head. And I was so aggressive in that game that... Um, Besides some of the more legendary enemies like the great, uh, the guardian apes, the um, of all people, the seven spears were giving me trouble. But I was melting people like cor the corrupted monk I beat on my second or third try, the tr crazy dragon thing with the green sword. Um, anybody that's played this would know what I'm talking about, but anybody else probably wouldn't. <laughs> the monkey? Um, yeah, the guardian ape was that was the monkey, and he was probably the hardest one for me to fight because of how erratic his freaking movements were okay. um so your thing with that game why you struggle at first was because you were playing it like the other games right correct and like, there's no invincibility frames in Sekiro I mean there are but significantly less whereas if you jump with Bloodborne or Dark Souls you can kind of phase through certain attacks if you time it right because they kind of give you that but because Sekiro is so specifically like this is the build you have you are not allowed to deviate from it um, mm -hmm. that's what was giving me so much trouble because I had built myself up as the dodging character in all of those others. So the fact that I had to parry and I couldn't dodge or move or deviate from that made me so mad for the longest time nice. um, that I quit. And now I finally had to go back. I figured it out and I am currently today on the last boss. And after this, I'm going to go back into it and work on it. But, um, Alejandro, the one other thing uh, I have saved that I have loaded up and the second I beat Sekiro, I'm going back to it is Days Gone. <laughs> you still haven't beaten that? Oh, no, no, no. I beat it. Um, I'm just, I found out all of the New Game Plus features that oh, I'm gotcha. giving you and I wanted to go back and play it on the hardest difficulty. But it was just the fact that, remember when we were all talking about when it came out, we were like, why do I love playing this game? It's not even that great. Mm -hmm. And there's, now... There's something about it. There's just something there's about something it. something about it. It just feels nice to play. And when they were kind of going to the details of how you play survival mode so differently, and I was like, you know what? Playing that with New Game Plus weaponry and having to really scrounge for what you can do and then like having an, your upgraded bike at least with mm -hmm. no fast travel i was like i feel like i could deal with that you know like the trade off of like i have my bike that has all the upgrades mm -hmm. but i have to travel on my own but i was like well i i feel like i could deal with that so i'm going to try it uh whenever i beat sekiro and uh, in real in real you. quick mm -hmm. did you ever finish horizon because that was that's what you were playing last episode <laughs> i did not <laughs> Once again, okay. I um I don't know what happened. Like I guess some other stuff was going on. I felt like playing different things. It's no, 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 no. I know what happened. Final Fantasy VII came out. Oh, you're right. That's so, totally what threw me off. Yeah. So yeah, Final Fantasy VII, which was one of our most anticipated games, came out, and uh, that one ruined me in a good way. Oh, yeah, <laughs> man. I'm telling you, Alejandro, I've got conspiracy theories for days on that thing. You got to finish that so we can talk. <laughs> I've I read like about. DJ wouldn't I, appreciate it. Yeah, I've read sort of, kind of like what the ending is because just for full disclosure, I'm yeah. only at chapter four. I yeah haven't felt the desire to play it for some reason. Chat, like, like comments, you got to tear him apart so he's gonna go I don't back know. and play that game. Yeah, like I'm, I'm waiting for it to hit because. Obviously, there's nothing really coming out, and there's going to be a game that I'm actually very excited about that comes out on June that I yeah. definitely want, and I'm kind of trying to use that. I like the pressure of something new to make me finish something. That's kind of how I did Doom Eternal, like I mentioned in the previous mm -hmm. episode, that That's I true. slogged myself through yeah. the horrible difficulty of that game to finish it in time for that one, but then I just... I don't know. There's... 
I wasn't in the right mind space for mm. after four chapters. I don't know why. But well, I'll tell that, you, hap- um, you're that on, happened to me. Let me think. Are you on the one with all the side quests? I just finished like doing the dart game and got first place and got a trophy for that. <laughs> so okay, yeah, because there's I had the same feeling. There's like maybe three points where the whole game kind of slows down. You have to do like a bunch of side quests, and then when you're finished, you can continue on with the main story. Or mm-hmm. I mean, you could, but I always felt like I have to like go through the side quests first because I'm a loser. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's that's one of those moments where it's like, oh, my gosh, this is so stupid. But then, like, the plot just immediately kicks back in. Um, yeah. So just if you ever hit that point, remember, it, the good stuff is coming. I know. And I know kind of what happens. I'm kind of looking forward to experiencing it because I think it's very bold for them to just give the middle finger to the original game. In, 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 in some in, ways, in some ways, spoil it too much. Right? Uh, so that's that. That to me is brave because I am one that is all about someone taking a chance in things instead of uh, having to be a exact replica of things. Mm-hmm. Kind of like what happened with Castlevania season three with Alucard, which yeah. I'm all I, yeah, I'm all for that. So um, because that to me is more exciting because if. If it's just an adaptation of something, I can really read the original thing. I know what it is. So I feel that's very exciting because then I feel it makes the rest of the game more unpredictable. Hmm. So, but yeah, um, I won't talk much more about that. I'm still in chapter four, still trying to muster the desire to play it. Originally, I didn't play it because uh, we're going to talk about it in the news at that time. Something yeah. bad happened in releases and all of that that made me feel that was gonna be the last game I was gonna play. And there's all it's kind of like that feeling you get with a TV show when you know you have three episodes uh, left before the yeah, series finale yeah. and you, you love it so much and it. you don't and you don't want to end it. So that's what happened to me. And and I was like, I kind of want to savor this because I'm enjoying because I was enjoying the four chapters I did, but then that kind of psychological yeah. hang up started. So I was like, mm. I'm gonna play other games and then when i'm done with those i'm gonna come back to this one uh but yeah so uh you other know, things I that i played that, yes <laughs> uh, other things that i played i was still slogging through this season of destiny 2 uh because mm. i pay i paid for it and i wanted to be done with that season and pass you didn't enjoy that too much did you it's the worst the game has been since launch like Dang. it sucks uh but they already know that this season sucked and I finally hit the point where I know when the game's going to suck. And it's usually around the same spot. That March to June era, it's always like a lull point yeah. for that game. And it, it's it been the same for three years straight. So this has been the worst it's been in those three years. But that usually means that whatever happens in June is going to be really amazing. Because that's how it's been also. So it kind of comes in waves. So... Yeah, the, the, uh, the Destiny community has been incredibly salty recently with like uh, the bare minimum they did for this season, and it didn't help that they had to work from home. So some updates that they needed to put in, like a specific auto rifle weapon, was like dominating the PvP meta for so much. Wow. Uh, it, it was literally like a laser show. It was like an wow. auto rifle that didn't have drop off damage. So it was like all that people were doing in the multiplayer. And then the PC version of that game has been like a, a cheater mess uh, uh, because it's free to play on Steam. And you can also learn about the cheaters that play Warzone. But they've kind of been, been doing something funny with how they've been dealing with cheating yeah. over in that Battle Royale while Destiny hasn't. Uh, done a good enough job for like what has been the big mode was trials of osiris which is like this pinnacle 3v3 mode that is kind of like like fighting against uh enemies and then you can like send them into Uh, other people oh no no that's no that's gambit uh that's that's gambit yeah that's gambit uh this is straight up pvp Mm. uh it's just like a high of like super high skilled players that you should go seven games without losing so you can reach a lighthouse with a chest that gives you special loot Gotcha. So the loot, have been cheating to get to. Yeah, oh yeah. The people have been cheating to get there. Uh, the loot that was at the top wasn't special, like it was in the original game. Oh. And uh, DDoS attacks have been like rampant. Uh, people using a lot of uh, aim bots and being caught on camera that they were using aim bots because uh, Destiny is very specific with its hit 
hit points. Uh, that wasn't much of a problem on like console, but the Destiny has not been in a good place. And I like that game a lot, but this was the season where it, it definitely was more chore than it was, but I needed to finish it because I paid for it. I paid for a season pass. I needed to complete that season pass. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm kind of like on a cleanse right now until the next season. And I'm kind of glad for that. Um, I finished the Spider-Man DLC because oh, I had nice. a, yeah, because I started it back in December, 2018. Oh, wow. And I enjoyed the first piece. It was fine. Like wasn't as great as the game, but it was like, it was more Spider-Man. The second DLC annoyed the crap out of me. Uh, some challenges uh, that I found. I had a friend. Oh who, yeah, I hated the second DLC. Now yeah, the, the the the, the screwball challenges. Yeah, I was like, ah, yeah. So there was especially the stealth ones were so annoying, and I stopped then. And then because I had a friend that was gonna play through them, I was like, you know what? I never finished them, and he's gonna beat me to. So I kind of just went back to it and yep. finished that second DLC. The third DLC was great. I really liked the third one. And yeah, I did like that. Was if yeah. I'm remembering it right. And I, it was good to remember how much fun that Spider-Man game is. Uh, it's just the joy of swinging around and re-clicking with the combat was mm-hmm. was like really fun. Yeah, that friend was also playing Horizon, which he platinumed also, and he almost convinced nice. me to go back to it because I freaking love that game. Hmm. <laughs> so I freaking love that game, but I don't have a reason to go back to it because I platinumed it. But True. I kind of want to experience it again, and I was kind of hoping, me like, hopefully Paul beat it because the ending <laughs> yeah. is really cool. <laughs> so I, I'm man, convinced I'm going to go back to it at some point. I mean, you went back to Days Gone, so. We're in for a long Gosh. summer anyway. So, yeah, but that's all I've been playing. I've actually been watching more than I've been playing recently. Yeah. I'm just, yeah, the, still trying to regain that energy to play something. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. It comes in waves. You shouldn't always be playing games, I've learned. Sometimes it's good to, like, let your mind urinate again instead of feeling like a chore. Mm. It's uh, something that I, I sometimes have to remind myself of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially during this break, because at the very beginning of this break, I was playing a lot, like trying to just play as much as possible and just enjoying the fact that I could live carelessly for a little bit. But you know what? Sometimes it's good to be reminded of the balance because you can always get bored of stuff. I know eventually I'll get bored of TV again and I'll, and the pendulum will swing back. Yeah. But that's it for what we've been playing, seeing or hearing. Yeah. Uh, Paul, so it's been a while, but we got got to shake big the cobwebs to, off it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Shake the cobwebs co- off. And I want you to press X because we got some uh, news. The first thing that we had to discuss today, Alejandro, is uh, what what's the going on with The Last of Us? Okay, so this show is going to try to touch in the big things that happened, maybe cursely in this time that we were off. But during that April, man, I I feel bad for Naughty Dog and what happened to this game. So, okay. So The Last of Us originally, uh, well, not original. Originally, the release date was going to be February 21st, as announced in three state of place ago from like back in September. Then three weeks later, that game got delayed till May 29th, which was the most hilarious thing in the world that they make a big event out of revealing the release date. And three weeks later, they have to delay it three months. And that's just like a complete failure in planning. Then in the middle of this, there was this article that came out saying that Naughty Dog is having severe crunch problems. Uh, an article from Kotaku where they were saying that they lost a lot of lead designers and a lot of animators. And that was the reason why like the game was like not showing up on time. Uh, and even th- an ex animator said that a more competent uh, producing uh, team could have shipped this game last year. If they had Dang. properly planned things, they said, he said it that way. It's a guy named uh, Jonathan Cooper. You can try to find him in Twitter. I remember when he mentioned, that. I was like, Oh, dang. So then uh, a few weeks after that, as the coronavirus started hitting and all that, 
The Last of Us got indefinitely delayed. Mm -hmm. So from its May 29, it went from, oh, we don't have a date anymore. And the reasoning was that um, they said that they wanted to honor the people that wanted the game physical and coronavirus has shut down like physical production in fact in factories and all that so mm -hmm. they, they indefinitely delayed it because they said that they wanted everyone to have the same experience at launch instead of like oh get it digital and then you these people get it later because um final fantasy 7 had that problem where uh because of this virus and actually this people got the, the game early like up to 10 days early because they needed to ship it because they didn't know if they were going to get it. Yeah, and the people and the people that got it digitally had to wait until the 10th, which was the the current release date. So that was kind of like their their excuse. Then literally 2 weeks later, catastrophic leak. Somehow um uh, there was like this apparently because the rumor originally was that there was a disgruntled employee that wanted to stick it to Naughty Dog because uh, of unpaid royalties and people bought that rumor because of the article that came out with the the, the crunch problems. Mm -hmm. And because literally it was like, have you gotten a spoil for you? Because I have. Uh, I know. I thank God I have known nothing about yeah. this. It literally like plot beat by beat that thing got like that thing got spoiled it's out there and it's so bad that if you go to literally every tweet that playstation posts if you scroll down to the comments you're gonna see the spoilers Jeez. people are men like people are evil how like they're spoiling the game and like putting like big things that out of context may seem like they're super controversial like this game's gonna be if you thought the last jedi was divisive i think we have a, the second coming coming with this thing, with some of the things that they're doing with this game, uh, and how this gonna like divide some story choices that they take that I'm not gonna say, but it got spoiled for me because people suck. Uh, a day after that leak, Sony posts puts a press release saying we got a new release date for The Last of Us and Ghost of Tsushima because Ghost of Tsushima had not been delayed at the point, but people expected it to be delayed because when Last of Us got delayed, Iron Man VR got delayed, which were games that were coming out in May while Ghost of Tsushima was still in June. So it's, I just find it funny that the date suddenly was like, it went from May 29th to indefinitely delayed yeah. till june 19th and the virus is still going and it's already gone gold and it's already gone gold yeah um the thing is that the game went gold recently so they were still finishing it like the game when it got indefinitely delayed was still not done goal when you say it's gold it's done front mm -hmm. to back like they they're confident with the product that they're putting and they can also do a day one patch if they want to keep working on it just to give an extra polish but it's like done 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 um and that completely took the wind off their sails. That sucks because this Last of Us is not going to have multiplayer. Not like the original one. And it all hinges on the story. And the story of the first game is what people loud from that game. That's what people love from it. And Naughty Dog... I didn't even like play the online at all until one of my friends like four years later was like, dude, you never played that? It's really good. A lot of it, that's one of like the more surprisingly fun multiplayers there are because people ignored it because it was like we play Last of Us or the single player. We don't need multiplayer, but it's still out and it was still pretty good. Um, and a lot of people were actually pissed when they announced that they were not gonna have a multiplayer on this one. That all the time was instead put because this is gonna be their biggest game yet, like ever, like and. To me, that it's kind of sad that uh, for a lot of people, the experience has been spoiled, especially because of the plot points that mention it. Because when you look at them, they're kind of bad. Like, the story choices are like, huh, why are they doing this? Mm. But then they've been, um, they've been begging, basically, people saying, it's a game you have to play it, see it all in context. Yeah. And... I still want... I, it actually made me more excited to play it because I kind of want to see it for myself. Just to like really see that because part of it is kind of unbelievable that that's the direction that they went with. Hmm. Man, I'm being very I'm, I'm being very vague with this, but yeah, uh, but it, it, to me that's kind of sad because this was they spent so much time on this when they could have maybe done a new IP 
especially how perfect the original game was, but they swerved up and down that they felt that this was a story that they could come back to and that they understood how like sacred the first game is. And for some people it's been ruined because of a plot by plot breakdown. Mm-hmm. And, and here's the thing. I remember when end game had a plot by plot breakdown. A lot of people said that it sucked based, based on like what they were reading. Huh. And I'm like, really? and yeah, there are a lot of people that said the same thing. When they started like just breaking break down in bullet points instead of experiencing it, then you go see the movie and it's actually amazing. Seeing it all how it unfolds and all that. It goes to show you sometimes that it's not about a bullet points and plot, it's how everything transpires. So maybe, who knows? It could be. But the problem is that now like the everything has been soiled. Every comment section that you can go is gonna have a a spoiler like just how bad it was assassin's creed's valhalla which kind of got revealed during this time the chat in the, the chat in the ubisoft uh stream was having last of us spoilers really? a company completely separate from from um from sony or anything doing a, a reveal for a different game people were spamming <laughs> the spoilers in the oh chat my gosh it's gonna be like like literally i tell you like if you really don't want to be spoiled by the thing and i hope you don't uh ignore every comment possible because people are jerks people are freaking jerks <laughs> yeah i i still remember um probably the only and worst time that i got spoiled for stuff was when fallout 4 was going to come out and somebody posted the the spoilers like i thought i was doing really good and somebody had a um a screenshot of what was going to be fallout 4's like weapon modification system which was like unheard of and you're like oh you can customize your weapon so i was looking at it Mm -hmm. and within the descriptions of like the weapon modification pieces each were a different fallout 4 plot spoiler (laughs) Like the level of detail that the person uh-huh. went into to make that. Oh man, I just, it makes me realize people just get so much enjoyment out of the idea that they know that they're going to ruin someone else's life. Or maybe not life. I mean, it's being a little a, ridiculous, but you get the idea. Yeah, people are jerks. Like, people are straight up jerks. They want to ruin everything for everyone. And to what end? Like, what do they gain from it? <laughs> to like, watch the world burn. Exactly. Literally, they're the Joker. They literally are. So, but yeah, Last of Us now has the June 19th uh, release date. That's the game that I mentioned in our What Have We Been Playing game that I'm excited about still mm-hmm. this day. And hopefully, that's what's going to jolt me into finishing Final Fantasy before it comes out. So, Truth. even though the plot has been spoiled, but I believe in them. Like, have you played a Naughty Dog game that's bad? I don't think so. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> there is nothing, especially from the recent output, since Uncharted 1 onwards. Yeah. And you can even go back to the Crash Bandicoot games, the first three, Jack and Daxter, 1, 2, and 3, even uh, the Jack X Racer, mm-hmm. then Uncharted 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, Lost Legacy, the original Last of Us. Like, their, um, their record so far is impeccable. Yeah. So, They've crushed it, really, exactly considering... So. <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, it's like until I play something and I'm like, oh no, they haven't. Yeah, they have. They haven't lost my goodwill yet. Maybe they will with this. We'll find out. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, I'm not gonna let the internet bully me into thinking it's bad just because of some out of context spoiler leaks. So, well, yeah, but yeah, well, poor Last of Us. Yeah, and unfortunately, got, up, yeah, then. yeah, and in, in a uh, little bit more. Yeah, positive much news. positive, much more positive. Alejandro, we have a not just like I know you've been hyping up the idea that E3 is gone, it is dead, it should be dead if it's not already. Um, just kill it, kill its family, kill its friends. And right. we finally, um, in the wake of E3 having to be canceled this year, mm-hmm. uh, what was the name of that guy again? Jeff Keeley. Jeff Keeley created the summer of gaming which gives us four months of different releases and announcements all coming together basically spreading e3 out into four months and giving a lot of those indie games a lot more time in the limelight what are you thinking about it it is exactly what i've been saying would be a benefit if you got out of that one week where you have like a deluge of announcements Mm -hmm. uh 
and then a summer of nothing True. because everything was like packed there. There is a merit of having so much happening at once because it's a big event. But then at the same time, how often do you remember a lot of what's there? You only remember some big stuff. Uh, and usually hype tends to ruin things eventually because E3, especially a lot of presentations and all that have been like dealing with hype in a way that mm-hmm. sometimes gets completely out of control. Yeah, especially I'm looking at you, Nintendo fans, and your Smash sure. reveal cycle, um, or anything related to Nintendo. Anyway, um, what the beauty of the summer of gaming is that the flexibility it gives developers because before everyone had to crunch and try to put something out for that week, the specific week in January. Now with this four months, with this four months that goes from May, June, July, all the way till August, where Gamescom in Germany would be which is not happening this year. Also another event that got canceled, like literally everything in 2020. Uh, they have all the time in the world to pick when they want to say that. And then Jeff Keighley is going to make a big deal out of it in a specific day and mm-hmm. give them a lot of, uh, because a lot of people try to use that kind of like as a center hub to like host streams and all of that. And he just like has connections to like really spread the word. This is the guy that makes the game awards, which have gotten, <laughs> exponentially bigger so big that microsoft decided to drop the reveal of their box in a game awards that's how you know how big this dude is that they were like yeah we're gonna reveal our console how it looks in an awards show of jeff Keighley. that's how you know how big he is and he was the guy that did the e3 coliseum for e3 the last couple years like he basically won uh putting all the big name developers to try to interview them and all of that in the middle of that show Hmm. now he's doing that on his own so I so far I say so far so good with um with how it's been going because we get one announcement, we discuss it, we digest it, we wonder if it was good or if it was bad. But it's better than having ten different announcements because you're eventually gonna forget something. So Oh yeah. I'm excited to see what else we get. And he keeps promising that there is a lot of summer left. And that to me is very exciting because when we started this show and we're gonna hit the uh the uh, summer, I was very scared about what we we're gonna talk about. <laughs> like, like literally, it feels like he did this for us. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, the first thing I would say, the first big thing that happened adjacent to this summer of gaming was an inside Xbox that happened on May seventh. So this would have been a week from today, actually. Mm-hmm. You didn't watch it, right? I did not. Okay. So I, I the way I wrote it here. It's an inside Xbox misfire. Why is it a mi- why yeah, is it a mis- I was, uh, We talked briefly about it, but uh, I, I really want your uh, extrapolation here on this one. What have I been saying about Xbox since they revealed the box back in December? And throw this been basically mercilessly beating Sony into the ground for the last like year. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah, literally. Uh, at least half for. Literally the span of half a year, because if you count December, January, February, March, April, now May, that's six months for like mm-hmm. literally the span of almost half a year. They've been like beating Sony to the punch with how they revealed their console, how they talked about it, the kind of information about it, how they posted the little video showing some of the capabilities of, it, of what it could do at a hardware level, like the loading and all of that. And all Sony had done at that point was doing that logo reveal. And the incredibly boring GDC presentation that they hyped up for no reason when they shouldn't have hyped it up when it was just a developer thing uh, where they literally talked about so much without really showing anything tangible. And then the big takeaway for everyone was that spec wise, the PS5 was going to be weaker than the Xbox Series X just from sh- comparing both sheets, like compare like directed, like you look both in a. Uh, you, bu- you look at both consoles, you put them next to each other with the spec sheets, and then one has a 12 while the PS uh, while the PS5 has a 10.28. Oh, Xbox has 12 teraflops when the PlayStation has 10.28 teraflops. That means the Xbox is more powerful by default because it has more numbers. And that is valid. That's how logic works, right? The more horsepower something has. Tell them how wrong they are, Alejandro. Yeah. I want to say they're entirely wrong, but that it goes to show you that there's a reason why Sony decided to go the way they did. Be- and and we're going to talk about it a little later because we're going on a timeline here. Um, but yeah, so they've been leading the charge and then suddenly they're like, okay, 
we're finally ready to start showing you next gen games what the next generation is going to look like we're going to do a inside xbox this is going to be kind of like a direct we're going to show you these games and we're going to show you gameplay of next gen Mm -hmm. and then you watch that 28 minute presentation and it's just quick trailers of games that look good cinematic yes cinematic trailers and i'm like did someone forget the memo that that we're supposed to see gameplay and uh especially because the big the the big thing that they hang their hat on in this uh, and in that entire presentation was assassin's creed valhalla Mm -hmm. which the week before the one where i told you that a lot of last of us spoilers were in the chat uh they had this guy named boss logic he was like doing art like live art revealing the game which was really cool and then the trailer dropped and then it was promised oh yeah next week on inside xbox you're gonna see gameplay for the first time everyone was like hell yeah we're gonna see gameplay Mm -hmm. like how the hut's gonna look and all of that and at the end it was just a quick cinematic trailer with in in engine footage that lasted like a minute with Mm -hmm. no hud nothing Mm -hmm. and you're like um did someone forget that this was supposed to be a gameplay reveal? Like, do anyone even know what it means to do a gameplay reveal at this point? Like, at least Ubisoft uh, doesn't. But yeah, they've Ubisoft officially does. apologized, apparently. Oh yeah, they have, and they should have because, like, at no point they cleared it up. They were that's how they were yeah. promoting it. That's how Xbox was promoting it and all that, and uh, and that ended up souring a little bit. And here's the thing: like, you can see glimpses of a little bit of gameplay in a bunch of the games that they show there. But th- that's not how this was sold. When you say that you're expecting at least a four to five minute demo, mm-hmm. when you say we're we're revealing gameplay of this, like, I like, what I picture is like what we got today with the state of play, which will yes, get to in a minute, exactly, but... literally that, exactly. That's what people were <laughs> expecting. So, uh, which is what that should be when you say reveal gameplay. You have to you both show it and mm-hmm. explain it you can't just show gameplay without context exactly or we won't so, know how impressive that is yeah so in six months where microsoft has just been doing so well with their messaging and all of that mm-hmm. and this was their foot forward where because they've been doing everything but show a game they've been talking hardware like literally they have over explained their hardware at this point the only thing that's missing is the price so now it's time to talk about the games and the fact that this was their first foot forward, even though they said from the very beginning, no exclusives. Like, they, our exclusives, our first party games are not going to be here. This is for third parties. Our exclusives are going to come out in July. Mm-hmm. It should be the other way. Mm-hmm. Just start, if you want to build hype for your machine, you start with your games. The reason why people buy your console. Other than either being the most powerful place to play third-party games, which is what the Xbox One X kind of was their pitch for, and some people you love it for that. You could argue that the people that want an Xbox are the people that would like that, though. Yeah, like the most powerful place to play third-party games. Yeah, I mean, that's how the what the Xbox One X has been the thing how they have hanged their hat on. Like mm-hmm. exclusives-wise, Xbox half of this generation has sucked. Like half of this generation, they barely had literally had nothing worth talking about from their exclusives. It's about the services, like their super consumer friendly way that they have approached uh, backwards compatibility and all of that. Like it makes it like they had everything except the final piece in the puzzle, which was like exclusives for people to really hang their hat on. And yes, they show they said that it's going to be until July. But then when you come with a third party showing that it's not even many third party games that would get people really excited about there are a bunch of cool like maybe independent stuff and there's like there's this one game that actually looked like titanfall i forget the name that say it was done by one chinese developer that actually looked really cool oh Uh, i forget what it's called but it's got like three words to it yeah it's exactly like the first person devil may cry that they were hyping up like oh it's uh, gonna be crazy exactly and, and, but it looked like uh like a preter titanfall the way how it was looking mm-hmm. but to me that was impressive just thinking oh only one dude did this that's impressive right. because when i think of games that are done by one dude i think of axiom birch which was done entirely by one dude so if that's where we're getting at that's actually cool but then when they showed games like J- the new jakusa game that was jakusa 7 but they changed the name of something dragon that, and the thing with those games is that they don't look better than what we have right now. 
there's there was nothing in that presentation that you looked at it and I'm like, wow, look how this looks. That's what next gen. That's why I want to upgrade there. Mm-hmm. And that's a really bad way to like say that this is how next gen starts. Because you know what that tells me? It's like, why should I upgrade if I have an Xbox One X? Games look literally like that right now. Mm-hmm. So it's like, in a way, they've kind of cut their own pitch in some way. Like, why would you need an Xbox Series X if this is how the games are going to be looking right now? At least just based on what they've shown. That they made a 28-minute presentation of this. And AC Valhalla looks pretty. It actually, But at the same time, you should really look at it. Style and all that, it still looks like AC Odyssey. Like, there was not anything there. How I they showed say- it. It, the lighting looks way more improved, but until they show me gameplay, I'm not going to... And the thing is, lighting, it's always the thing that's going to look more improved Every whenever we're going farther into every game. That's look true. at the lighting Look at the lighting from Black Flag, which was the one that we have right now, and the, the, the one that launched this past console generation, and look at the lighting in Odyssey, night and day, same mm-hmm. console. So it's like, lighting is something you can always like um, hang your hat on. Uh, that's always going to be improved. So it's not like you don't see when this console is like, we have all these teraflops. We have like, um, our console will be able to run games at 120 frames a second. Our console has a solid state drive that's going to like eliminate loading and blah, blah, blah. And nothing that you showed there really takes advantage of that. It just looks like the pretty games that we already have. That was a huge blunder for them because they've been leading this whole new cycle. They they took the flag and they're like, we're talking about next gen because literally we have nothing else. So we can start the next gen train rolling. And they left themselves a little vulnerable as we're going to talk a little bit later. So, But in between that, uh, Misfire, Summer of Gaming also gave us a couple interesting Very announcements. Very interesting ones. So like, so like uh, are you excited to finally play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 again? Because I, I sure am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like part of me really doesn't want to spend money to buy it, but part of me like screams to sing Blink 182 <laughs> or Superman <laughs> again. <laughs> get really into that. Oh, yeah. Um, oh my god. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, Activision, uh, as we I think we talked before in this show, had said that. They were trying to uh, leverage their back catalog and try to pursue more remakes because the Crash Trilogy remake was a huge success for them. Spyro Trilogy, huge success for them. Um, Mm -hmm. Modern Warfare Remastered, uh, huge success for them. Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remastered, relatively successful for what it is. Just a $20 thing. And what else do they have in their back catalog? And a lot of people associated that with Tony Hawk. Because the Marvel games that they used to do, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. Because Also true. Because uh, because if you remember back in the day, uh, they did a lot of Marvel games that had Activision's name slapped on them. Uh, the Never Stop games, all that. So I'm actually surprised that they're able to do that because I don't know how much you remember of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. The I heard some very bad things about it, that's for sure. Oh, oh yeah, the abysmal... 2015 release that was so bad that is one of the few games that you can go on Metacritic and has a 34 when so many games has like 60s, 70s, 80s and some people are like, oh that game has a 73 in Metacritic, that must be garbage yeah, which kind of tells you how badly skewed people are when they look at reviews and all this stuff, but it has a 34 that's how bad that game was and uh, originally um uh, the rumor was that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 happened because Activision had not used its license for like years at that point since like the HD remake of Pro Skater that was on PS3 and 360 that was not very good. It didn't feel right. Mm. Um, and the license was about to expire in 2015. So they cobbled together a game to say, hey, we released a game at the end of this license. And it was like, but it was so bad. Like, look at the glitch videos of that thing. It's incredible. I've never seen like like it's like borderline uh, goat simulator uh, <laughs> brokenness and like a game that they were charging sixty dollars for. So somehow I don't know in the in five years, 
Activision renew the license and they're able to do a remake again. And this time do it with Vicarious Visions, who has worked on those Tony Hawk games before. The guys that did Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 only worked on Tony Hawk Ride, that game that you needed to play with like a actual skateboard. You Which probably rem- I feel like I would have totally broken if it existed today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, those were the, and that was a t- horrible game. And they were the ones in charge to do Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, which, of course, was another horrible game. But by Carrie's by, by Visions, uh, excellent work they did with Crash, excellent work they did with Spyro. When Bungie was still working with Activision with Destiny 2, uh, by Carrie's Visions actually helped a lot with a lot of content they did for Destiny 2 to help with like, the content rights and all that. And uh, actually like did some of like the better content that Destiny 2 got in the second year uh, before the split. And they're a pretty good developer. And apparently there's a rumor that they're remastering Diablo 2. Also. Really? Yeah. There was like a report that came out a couple days ago that Activision has like scaled up that studio so much because while their other studios never release a game, like when was the last time Blizzard released a game? Overwatch. And they had, the, and after the whole Blitzchunk fiasco that happened last year with China. And then uh, BlizzCon, they re- they revealed Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2, but those games are nowhere near close to being done. They enlisted Vicarious Visions to do a re- uh, remaster of Diablo 2 also, according to the report. So this Tony Hawk Pro Skater game being done by them, it'll be good. I know for a fact they've been doing a lot of good stuff. And it's only 40 bucks for two games. That's true. That's I, really I good. give them that much. Yes. This could have been easily a $60 game. Freaking Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5 was that. But I feel they understand that they found something really cool in the market. Tap into someone's nostalgia. Give them a package of 40. People are going to eat that. And it's coming on September 4th. So finally, we have fall games to look forward to. (laughs) That is very true. And that means that they put that uh, release date out since it, what, came out yesterday? That means Uh they know, based on what's going on with the virus, that they're pretty sure it's still going to come out at that time. And that definitely impresses me. Exactly. Um, And not only that, I feel like um, the virus has finally become normalized everywhere else, that they finally have a little bit of an idea how they're going to tackle this. And I also feel we have finally hit the threshold when they realize that digital is a thing that yeah. skyrocketed in this month and a half that we've had since we last um, recorded sales have been like quadrupled when it comes to digital. And a lot of people finally understand that that's the future. So they finally understand that they can actually make money by people not buying a disc, but actually buying it digitally. So maybe they finally realize that no matter what, they can still release those games without having to bother with a disc, which was the whole point about that last of us delay in the first place. And then it turns out it was only three weeks. So, uh, you know what else just got confirmed for a remake, Alejandro? What else, Paul? The Mafia trilogy of all things. I feel like uh, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> could have been knowledge. Like I think that I even remember them saying that they were having trouble, like securing the ability to actually keep making them or something. Um, especially since it was 2K. I think like the original c- company that made it doesn't exist anymore. Or something. Uh, like it was yeah. Uh, not quite. It was like 2K always. So 2K always did Mafia. Like, okay. That, that's what, but they uh, like absorbed another company into them to do it, didn't they? 2K Check, which has, I think it's long dormant now. Like the Check studio that did Mafia 1 and 2 no mm-hmm. longer exists. But okay. some people then went to the studio called Hangar 13. Uh, uh, which I is, remember that, yeah. Yeah, which uh, it's actually uh, the director of Hangar 13, Hayden Blackman, it was actually the director of Star Wars The Force Unleashed back in the day. What? Uh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, Hayden Blackman. So, And his studio did Mafia 3, which came out in 2016. Uh, and that game had a little bit of a development trouble. It was yeah, in development exactly. for a while. And uh, the game was a little busted when it came out. It had a really amazing story, but the game was like a little so far. But it sold well. And there's been like... Um, a lot of talk that they already had like pre-pro on Mafia 4 or an idea for Mafia 4. And maybe something kind of happened there. Uh, but there was always been like talks about what happened with Mafia 1 and 2. Like those games are all, are they ever going to be brought back? Because you can play Mafia 2 on Xbox One backward compatibility. Yeah. 
Yep. If you if you're wanting to, but good game. If anybody's listening, it's just uh, don't expect to get a lot out of the open world. It's exactly. really plot driven. Hey, as someone that has said that it's sick to death to open worlds, just something that is just straight mission to mission without so much distraction no, to me. I can it's, appreciate uh, it, yeah. but I feel like they shouldn't have made it like a full open world if With they're going to be doing. Yeah, mm-hmm. if they're going to like have you be in the plot then don't give everybody for like all these directions to go yeah yeah then you see the mafia 3 problem when then they decided to try to pack the open world to the point that that the side content became obligatory for you to experience in the missions and the side content was more repetitive than listening to people and stacking people in assassin's creed 1 which was the big problem in that game it was like someone took that template and made it worse in mafia 3 yeah. in mafia 3 so <laughs> so if that's how you're going to do it, it's better to just like do mission after mission. You have so many open world games with their side stuff that they do better. But yeah, they announced it as a Mafia trilogy, but they're also going to release the games individually. And there's a rumor that Mafia 2 comes out next week. And then... Um, hey, Ma- what? Yeah, Ma- Mafia 2 will come out next okay, week. Okay, so yeah, hold up. Let, let's roll this back a second. So I don't know a lot about this knowledge outside of the fact that it is the mafia trilogy um so you're saying it's going to be individual not like a whole there's going to be a bundle there's going to be a bundle with the three but if you want to buy them individually they also got release dates so so you're saying the mafia two one's going to come out soon on the 19th that's what like the rumor said so uh yeah and it should pop up it's kind of like what happened with modern warfare remaster that suddenly popped up and it was there um Mafia One though has an August twenty eighth release date. That's getting but the, like fully yeah it's up, right? yeah it's it, it it that literally has the full on uh, Crash Bandicoot slash uh, by Carrie Visions kind of remake. When you mm. see those screenshots, I remember when I posted those screenshots I in saw our group. Some of that, and I was like thrown off because I saw like the trailer, and it looked still kind of like okay, they like updated things, all right. But then like the screenshots, you were saying like something wasn't adding up. I was like, that looks like a different game. But it's Mafia One Remastered, like that's they amazing. completely. The it's basically a remake, and that comes out on August twenty eighth. So another game to look forward to. I will definitely be picking that up that's for yeah sure. and i am wondering if there's gonna be like a bundle that you can get all of them at a specific place and i would hope honestly yeah like especially being a mafia trilogy i would love for them to go back to the mafia 3 game and tweak it because the I thing is like that, that too, yeah. because gunplay is fun in that game the story is amazing with like uh uh, that New Orleans, uh, being do you a black guy and the things that it did with the world, how like the police reacts to you when you're like in a black neighborhood and how yeah. they react in white neighborhoods. It has so much cool stuff in Not it. Not to mention that's where I live. So, oh, exactly. <laughs> so like I love doing that. Like I'm driving by all there is. I mean, it's heavily truncated and mm-hmm. like the West Bank is on the North Shore for some reason where the tower that uh-huh. does exist, the final tower um exists today it is condemned building but it is literally so expensive to mess with that they don't touch it it's just sitting there abandoned for anybody that wants some context to that yeah um but yeah it's it's awesome exactly it has all that awesome stuff but because the main thrust of the game if you're trying to like destroy all these mafia empires by you having to do all this repetitive stuff and all that that ruins that game and it's just because it has a really cool story that people should experience without like that. And if they were able to like package it all together and they were able to go back to Mafia 3 and tweak mm-hmm. that to be more like the other mafias, which are like the mafia games have always been strong in their story. That's what makes them strong. So right. why why try to like tick the boxes of open world gaming and hide the thing that's best that you do best in that point? So oh, yeah. That's... That would be amazing, and it would literally justify me buying it as a trilogy again, like that. If um, because because if, if it's the same game, exactly, like I am not gonna bother paying full price for all three. I'll just buy yeah. one and two separately. So yeah, I, if I, I hear it, because yeah, they it, gave it to us for free uh, one month with PlayStation Plus. Ah, uh-huh. and I bought it at launch. Next, uh, yeah, same I, actually. <laughs> yeah, I bought it with Rise of the Tomb Raider 20th Anniversary Edition back in 2016. I bought those mm. games together. Uh, so even though I That's... already have 
Tomb- that's another series that I feel hasn't aged the best. The uh, Tomb Raider. Yeah, uh, I liked Rise of the Tomb Raider the best of those three. Um, yeah. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, not as good. But yeah, uh, that would be cool. But just the fact that I could finally experience the first Mafia and that with that kind of detail, I'm like, mm-hmm. m- more thing to look forward for the rest of this year because it still feels a little barren. So, all right. So now in be- now that we're done with like the first batch of announcements, um, mm-hmm. yesterday also, because that's so funny, the Mafia trilogy was also announced in the same day as this happened. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, so Jeff Keighley again from Summer of Gaming, he was hyping up a special reveal for yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far there had been game announcements because the previous day was for Tony Hawk. And this one was finally giving us a glimpse of the Unreal Engine 5. For people that don't know, a lot of the games that you play are made with engines. And you probably have seen the logo Unreal Engine 3 or Unreal Engine 4. So... This engine is that's basically what makes games what they right. are. They are the, the tools toolbox. to make games. Yeah. So this was their first time that they showed what the next generation of their toolbox will be, which will be a full number ahead instead of being like a Unreal Engine three point five, like it was for a while, and then Unreal Engine four, and right now they're on Unreal Engine four point twenty five. This is full five. Dang. And they showed a tech demo that was not like canned. It was actually like with gameplay, even though it's not gonna be a game that's in development and all that, they actually built it to be like, this is how it would look in a real game. And they showed it running on PlayStation 5 and on a PlayStation 5 dev kit because we still it don't know what that... It looked pre-rendered because like, I, I almost wish that I could get my hands just on that like 30 seconds or whatever, t- however long it was. The thing I'm is that... I'm curious to thing... see like what was actually special about it. <laughs> Uh, so do you, do you see the eight minute thing or do you only see the thing at the end? Because there was an eight oh. minute demo. There was an oh. eight minute demo where they're oh, like, I, I hold up. I'm going to go look this up. Cause all I saw was that little, th- uh, the thing, yeah, the the thing that's flying. flying through. Yeah, exactly. And no, that's like, that's the end of the demo. You actually see the demo and they tweak it. Like they do the thing they do with demos where oh, they, okay, they yeah, I just found nine minutes long. I'm going to mute yeah. it and like skip through while we're talking. Yeah, they where they like break it break down what it does, especially with lining and keeping uh, the texture detail of so many things that they're oh, shoot. that that they apply it to uh, the SS the, the custom built SSD that the PS5 has. Mm-hmm. So um, and how how did I mention how that is helping them make like more like complex geometry? in oh the care in the character model and how that works with uh with like the individual light sources like if you're using like a lamp you actually see the character that they're moving uh he's the care the character is like climbing you actually see bottom prompts so you you know that it's a demo of something yeah, that they built um... I'm seeing it now because all I'd seen was that little minute at the end, mm-hmm. um, and it looked almost like like a set piece in an Uncharted game where you have like a little control but not a lot. Mm-hmm. But this exactly. is like this is definitely more along those lines. And my gosh, that looks good. Exactly, and this is done in the apparently underpowered PlayStation Five exactly. compared to the Xbox Series X. So that goes to what everybody's like looking for. Like, this is what you would expect to see. Yeah. And somehow with all the stuff going on, Sony still comes out first with actual gameplay of what it would look like. Exactly. They they come out not quite because we have to always temper expectation that this isn't a game. But the thing with tech demos is that they give you the vision of what games can look like. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the tech demos of 2012 and look at the games that are coming out right now, uh, because 2012 was when Unreal Engine 4 got revealed, and then PlayStation 4 came out a year later, and you see the evolution of like that technology, and you see that the promise of those tech demos has like mostly been fulfilled, if not exceeded, based on a, on a different one. So, but you always at least want to uh, you like when it comes to next generation, you want the promise of what it can do. The promise can sell your system. Oh yeah, uh, like a tangible promise and. Epic doing it this way is the best tech demo, like the best technology showcase they've done because it at least showcases things in a more realistic way, even if we know that games are not going to look like that initially. In fact, they already made it clear that 
this engine will become available uh, next year for developers. That if they're working on a real engine four, they will be able to transition to five with no problem. Um, and they're gonna like have a little bit of pathway for them to adapt the ter- the, their technology. But seeing it that way, that was like the first. Uh... Yeah, you're still looking at it. At Can what you part imagine are you? an Uncharted game <laughs> like this? Yeah. Or a Tomb Raider uh, like that. Yeah, exactly. That oh, kind of shoot. game. Like that. So, and remember, Unreal Engine is like a very universal engine. So a lot of mm-hmm. people can... Everybody gets access to I it. Guess I guess access to People make their whole games out of it. Well, and a little and a little fun fact, The Mandalorian uh, actually had a lot of its sets rendered on Unreal Engine 4. So now, that... I didn't know it was Unreal Engine 4. That's crazy. Yeah, so um, imagine if they were able to... And Mandalorian looked really expensive. Like it didn't oh, yeah. feel like a cheap but TV show. But it wasn't. Show. That's what's crazy. Uh huh. Exactly. So it it had the quality, and that was done on Unreal Engine four. So Unreal Engine five, you guys imagine what it can do, and just like how it can leverage that. And Epic did an interview with Jeff Keighley after they revealed this demo, and uh, and then they were talking how uh, they're actually working in tandem with Sony because they're trying to see how they can optimize best towards this ssd because if they optimize well for this then they can scale down and they mentioned how uh this exact same demo and how they presented and all that they would have to downgrade it if they ever wanted to present it that way in the xbox series x Mm -hmm. which goes to show you that yes the xbox series x has more horsepower in teraflops but it also goes to show you that sony is compensating for not having maybe that amount of teraflops elsewhere. So amazing. What, so yeah, uh, they're able or they're going to be able to do. Because I remember when the PlayStation Four came out, a lot of people were like, "Man, this doesn't even look all that better than the PS3." Like they got the particle effects, but like it, it took a year or two for the the teeth to really sink in. You know. Um, not not only that, it took people to actually see it, um, mm-hmm. you know. So because uh, I remember uh, the kills on Shadowfall demo when the PS4 uh, was revealed. When they looked, it was like, man, this looks pretty, but it doesn't have that huge leap. And then when people actually got to see it on a TV, you're like, okay, I can see. We can see where the technological leap is coming because I remember uh, showing my dad both Call of Duty Ghosts on PS4 and then Kills on Shadowfall. Because when he was watching us play Call of Duty Ghosts, his first thought was like, what was the point of buying the console? It doesn't look that different. Mm-hmm. And then he looked shot of Fall. I was like, oh, I see now. <laughs> so and I think we, we have to like keep in mind that we're finally heading to a point where YouTube compression and all of that, it's not going to be the proper... Um, it's, it's not going to give us the proper details that we think of. Mm-hmm. And it, it it always takes us actually seeing it for ourselves. I remember I thought the same thing when God of War was showing demos before a month before the game came out. A lot of people were like, oh, damn, they downgraded this thing. And then you actually see in your TV is like, oh, no, they actually improved the graphics. And same with Spider-Man. Spider-Man had this whole puddle right. gate. I remember and, that. And it's this whole puddle gate controversy because this puddle of puddles of water that were in the original demo were not there. And so people and because it was being shown in a more compressed video, people are like, oh, man, they downgraded Spider-Man. Then Digital Foundry from Eurogamer. I was like, what if we tell you the game has been improved, actually? Mm-hmm. <laughs> from this time, people are like, oh. And the guy and, was like, it's a different time of the day where it wasn't uh-huh. raining. So exactly. It's like, or more like we took the water out because we increased level of details everywhere else. And here's the proof. Mm-hmm. Like the suit actually has more pores that you can see. Right. So, there's always that that we're gonna be facing as we move forward, and I know people love talking about downgrades. I know when I was like looking at the state of play, the live chat was a cesspool of people saying downgrade, 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 mm-hmm. and then people went back to actually see the actual 4K feed, and we're like, oh my god, this is pretty. Um, so that's something that we have to deal with. But Unreal Engine Five was the first time I'm like, because literally I was talking with a friend because he finished Final Fantasy, the same guy that finished. Horizon and Spider Man, that I tell you, he also finished Final Fantasy mm-hmm. and he had just gotten a PlayStation 4, which is an odd time to get one, but wow. any, yeah. anyone, anyone gets one at the, at the proper time. And he was asking me, it's like, how can they improve this? He was like, because he was like, look how 
good Final Fantasy VII looks. Like, how can they improve it? I literally said, I don't know that you can. I literally said that. I think the improvements are just going to be more subtle now. Because we finally hit, like, a point where a lot of games just look too pretty. That Stranding, we're like, back into that Stranding, uh, Horizon. It's gone. Looks pretty. I would give it that to that one. Uh, Gears 5, like, so many games. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, like, God of War. Like, all these games look so freaking amazing and beautiful. And do you just feel, okay, can they even go further at this point? And that Unreal 5 demo at least gives me an idea that they can. Because the thing that people forget, especially that final section, is that and how quick that character is moving through all the things that are crumbling. Usually when you see that in other games, the game loads halfway through or the textures pop in mm -hmm. or uh, or like or level of details kind of fade in and out of existence. The same amount of detail is the same as you see. Like if, if, if you like scroll through that, you right. see that that level of detail is not lost because you're not streaming it from a disk or you're not having like a hard drive that has to load those assets. Those assets are there in the SSD. So... It's like, that's a real great promise. And at the very least, shows me that there's not going to be like a graphical discrepancy that severe. Mm -hmm. Whether the 12 teraflops of the Xbox Series X comes into play into multi-platform games. Now we know that uh, we shouldn't write Sony off for doing like a quote-unquote weaker system. Mm -hmm. And this is the first tangible thing. Which again goes to show you, don't just give us specs, don't just give us numbers. Show. That's all I gotta say. Hmm. Well, speaking of showing, I, I well, I know that I am super excited for everything that they can do with Unreal Engine Five and just all this next generation stuff. I'm so excited for it. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to some of the simplicity, we had another announcement that came out that I believe out of nowhere, out of nowhere, yeah, literally this morning. PJ. Uh -huh. I know PJ, of course, is ecstatic about it, but. Um, we got a new Paper Mario coming out. The, what was it? The Origami King? Was that what it was? Yeah, called? Paper Mario the Origami King. And just as a thing is that we've known this was coming because if, we're, if you remember in our last episode, mm -hmm. there was that report about the Mario games yeah. that this was going to be a big Mario year for Nintendo. So there's the... The room, like there, those reports are, are like the Mario sixty four, Sunshine, and and Galaxy are gonna be coming to the Switch, and apparently they're gonna be bundled together, based on how they're saying. And then Mario three D World is gonna have the definitive edition mode, kind of like Super Mario Bros U Deluxe, that's gonna be released separately. But then they that report also mentioned Paper Mario that they were trying to do a more traditional Paper Mario game to come out this year, and Paper Mario has been down in the dumps for a while. Like, that series hasn't had, like, a standout game for a while. Especially one that was an RPG in the vein of the GameCube one, A Thousand Years Or, or the 64 one. So, this Paper Mario that came out today is the first one that feels like it's going back to that. Not 100% to that same style, but close enough that you can say, oh, it's an RPG. Uh, have you played Paper Mario? I did not. My brother did a little bit, and I watched it, and it just it is not my thing. Um, but I know a lot of people really loved it, and so I'm excited for them. Mm -hmm. But because I know it's such a beloved series, and there's only really like a couple of main entries in that series, uh -huh. um, so I say all power to them. But yes. I will definitely <laughs> not be getting it. Uh, no. So my thing with Paper Mario is that I've been, I've gone on record that I don't like turn-based RPGs. Like turn-based mm -hmm. RPGs annoy the crap out of me, especially because I just select and watch the action happen. What makes Paper Mario so good is that it is a turn-based RPG, but you interact with it. So like you press, like for example, um, in Paper Mario from GameCube, you choose your attack with Mario. Mm-hmm. And that attack is to like jump on the enemy. So how you do is that you you select the attack and then Mario goes there, but then you have to press the jump button and then time the jump button by uh, in the uh, when you jump and then you have to press the A button when you hit the enemy to bounce from that enemy and bounce back again mm -hmm. to do like more damage. So you're like actively still controlling the character if you're, if you're picking uh, the you're picking the actions. And then for mm -hmm. example, uh, he has the hammer. If you want to attack to the hammer, then you get 
Jutsu like hammer, he gets close to the enemy. Then you have to hold stick left. So, mm -hmm. so, so like if he's like lifting, lifting the hammer, and then you release the stick at a specific point to like hit the enemy to uh, to do more damage. If you like release it too soon, you barely do damage. If you release it at a specific point, you do the damage. It's like it's active battle in right, a way I that's guess. very entertaining. Instead of like because it's usually like like in Persona, you pick the attacks, it happens, and then you have to wait for your turn to happen again. And hopefully, you don't get killed or like old Final Fantasy. That's the kind of turn base I don't like. But Paper Mario works. And this is the reason why I actually like the South Park games. Because uh, South Park, the Stick of Truth, was literally Paper Mario. <laughs> that, is, that is a good point. That's true. It literally was Paper Mario. And that's why I enjoyed it. Because it's like, I'm not passive just selecting menus and watch it happen. It feels like I'm like defending myself. I'm like picking this stuff. That's the kind of thing I like for my games. So I'm excited for this Paper Mario. On Fortunately, it also comes out of the same day as another game, which was shown today. Which is what I am excited about. I know you you and I have a bit of a discrepancy on uh, our excitement related to this. Let me let me lead in and then we can start the discussion. Um, Go for it. So today we got 18 straight uncut. Well, I mean, edited, but mm -hmm. um, we got actual gameplay of Ghost of Tsushima. We got specific voiceovers on how the exploration is going to work, um, how the world kind of operates, the how the combat really works, and customization and like what that really entails in the end. So, um, just like short version, we figured out that um, it's like really heavily immersive on like trying to minimize the menus as much as possible it seems um your direction and navigation whenever you're going to a place is indicated by the direction of the wind um specifically there's like a guiding wind that flies by you if you like active like hit the button to see hey where am i going um then there's like the only real indications of things around you is going to be either um smokes smoke like billowing up you've got these said like strange uh strangely shaped trees or like damaged trees and like little animals that might come by and direct you towards something that's near um besides like the actual map itself and then from there we've got you can have what was it um you start off as like a samurai and as you're building your skills you become more like a ninja and i that's like probably the first point where i'm not sure how that's going to look personally because um yeah i know they, did, they didn't um, quite no they didn't quite say it. they said that you can like choose your style like based yeah, on like the armor that you have that. so you can either pick to be more of like a like a combat samurai or more like a stealth ninja and that's like based on like the armor that you pick and how you spec your character, something like that. So, yeah, I think that's what he was saying. That's one thing I I do hope there's going to be an option to just like full let me look the way I want, but also like get benefits. But then I feel like if they did that, it would kind of defeat the purpose of what they're going for. So I think yeah, why would you, why would you dress as a ninja if you want to go all guns all sorts blazing? I know, that's kind of that, that. Yeah, that's kind of. <laughs> It's like part of me wants to look I'm more referring to the idea of like if I want to really fight all my enemies in front of me just be a straight up brawler but I want to look like the cool Ronin with just like the um not kimono because that's not right um mm -hmm. just like basically your regular outfits and your cloak like you saw in the the first part of the trailer game, gameplay moment with your cool little hat but like you want the defense of like the armor well you're gonna have to sacrifice the cool look of your cloak for heavy armor mm -hmm. um so I, I was a little bit sad about that but then also they were saying how um uh you were they were wanting you to i guess trade off and pick one side or the other based on like mm -hmm. how you want to be either like stealthy or um maybe like a harder hitting samurai um mm -hmm. i do I don't think it's going to be like a loot base, which I'm very glad for that. Um, it's not going to be um, like, well, look at it. Like there's not going to be that basic, like, Hey, you've got your weak stuff and then you're going mm -hmm, to get, yeah. 
better versions of it. I mean, I think it's more like you're building up your skills <laughs> and that's going to change the attributes of the armor. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it that. Um, it feels like it is loot, but more in the armor that you have to like find that armor to be spec towards a specific play style. That's kind of right. how they're how, how they're doing it. So kind of um, like Dark Souls, you can imagine, because you can't like just get, hey, this is the armor of this guy, and there here's an exactly the same looking armor that's better. Yeah, it's, it's this more... is the arm. This is the armor that has more resistance. This is the armor that makes you stronger. Something exactly. like that. It could be something more like, like that. that. Yeah, that's what mm-hmm. I'm thinking. Um, which uh, they've they've proved that they can make a more streamlined experience with that because um, the more you try to focus in on one kind of armor to just upgrade it by numbers wise that's when you start getting into a li- like the odyssey kind of levels of stuff and it, it gets a little convoluted after that mm-hmm. um i what was the other thing that i was the most concerned about um i i definitely i'm calling it now i'm gonna get lost so often because <laughs> as much as i love immersive ideas of things i get turned around so quickly and i miss very obvious things that people feel like how did you miss that and i go i did <laughs> but i bet what they um what they do is that um because horizon can be immersive if you want it to be god of war can be immersive if you want it to be right but you can have the option to like turn that off and have like a super busy hot if you want so uh, that's that's my issue though at some point like i almost need the hud as far as like certain aspects of it just to understand what's going on um that's what how am i wording this oh okay here we go so you've got like your dead space that incorporates that mm-hmm. in such a way that it really works well for you um, and you can have a clear, non-cluttered setup. But then you've got something like Ghost Recon Wildlands, where they're like, yes, mm-hmm. look at all of these amazing customization options that you can not, like, you can take away parts of the HUD. Well, if you take away certain parts of the HUD, you're putting yourself at, like, a mega disadvantage in order to play the game. Like, it should be kind of, like, one and the same, where if you're moving something, you should still be able to, like, just tap a button to pull up what you need. Rather mm-hmm. than, oh, okay, great, now I got to go back into the options, I got to change this, got to do that, or whatever. And it looks like Ghost of Tsushima is trying to go that route, where like if you tap a button, it'll pull up the menu for a second, mm-hmm. and then it'll go away quickly, so you get your whole idea, um, your whole image back, you know? Um, Red Dead Redemption 2 tried doing something similar, where you mm-hmm. could make the map smaller or larger, and then I realized it was so impractical to have it small because I couldn't find anything Yeah, <laughs> um, that I could only turn it off at certain times. However, they have the option where if you just hold the down directional button, you pull mm-hmm. up the option. You could just tap a button. Boom, it's gone. Mm-hmm. Do it again. You're back. So Exactly. They give you the they... option to, to like need it. And if you want to immerse and just like, yeah, just switch it off in in-game. Right. And I'm hoping that that's going to be like prevalent throughout all of that um the only other thing that i think i I fear is um if the combat is going to get stale because i wasn't really Mm -hmm. understanding like okay so the guy comes at me he gets like a one-hit kill for those three guys i wasn't sure if that was like a special move i was kind of in the middle of getting groceries if i'm honest Mm -hmm. while that was happening so i was missing a couple of the smaller details while it was up but for what it looks like it's like it's an insta kill if you get the parry right like if you're able to parry um uh you can do like an insta kill where you dismember an arm or something like that and um it gives you like that option to do like uh like a duel like if you press the up d pad uh, you get close to an enemy, you press up, and then it goes into like this. Uh, you face each other, and then the enemy rushes you, and then you have to like time it correctly and insta kill the enemy. So, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, I have this amazing tweet from this, uh, from, uh, that kind of sums up what I thought what the, this game mm-hmm. looked like. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima looks like Assassin's Creed, Red Dead Redemption 2, and Tenshu had a threesome. <laughs> you're not wrong actually yeah. it really does feel like red dead redemption 2 when i looked at it mm-hmm. yeah now that I'm like about it. exactly like when you're seeing like the horse and all that and i'll lighting. yeah the lining all of that I, like how it 
how the character moves. And also, I, I would add Arkham because of the uh, the like stealth the kill. No, oh, no, no, okay, no, yeah. no, no, the stealth kill. Like, if you have like two enemies and then you like kill one and then move the camera and it illuminates and then you press, I think it's square or triangle. In Arkham, yeah. it was like the fear takedowns. It was Arkham yeah. Knight. So I will say they weren't the one, the first ones to do that, but I, I they were ones to popularize that idea. I think more, um, I in more recent first, in more recent time for like a, a ste- like something stealth that allowed you to like chain stealth kills like that. It was definitely Arkham Knight. I can't mm. think of another game that did that before because Arkham City just did the double takedowns, which was R two triangle or R T Y if you're playing on Xbox. Uh, mm-hmm. Part of me, like, I think the way I see Ghost of Tsushima is this is the Assassin's Creed game that people have been asking Ubisoft for years. And Ubisoft did all these other eras so that Sucker Punch came in and be like, yeah, we're going to do it ourselves. So uh, to me, it looks fun. But it looks like another open world game with so many different same mechanics for me that I'm like, it's something that I'll play when it's there. Because I like that kind of game, even though I've been burnt out on open worlds in a way. Uh, the thing to me that makes this unique is absolutely the samurai setting and seeing how they take cues from actual samurai, uh, from actual Kurosawa films, mm-hmm. and being able I to get all for that. <laughs> and 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 the fact that you can play the game from the very beginning in a Japanese track and put it in black and white, that to me it's oh, like. Yeah. Like from a gameplay standpoint, the game doesn't impress me at all. Like, yeah. the, the, like the gameplay is generic open world uh, in a way that I'm already like that. It is what it is. By the time that we reach it, I will probably have not been playing an open world game for a while. That it will feel like it'll be worth it. It's just another Sony game that's an open world. So just gonna put it out there. But guess, it looks depending on what you play in the meantime. Exactly. Exactly. It'll depend on because it, it could be another Borderlands 3 situation where yeah. uh I was playing that kind of game in a bench and then went to that and what and burnt out before everything got going and only really clicked with it uh after the fact. So I'm gonna try to not play open worlds from here until July because Maybe I'll be, I'll be hungry for that. But that game lives and dies by the strength of its samurai, samurai setting for me. And uh, that to me is like the standout thing. I will say this, though. When the Last of Us leaks happened, immediately I was like, I'm more excited for Ghost of Tsushima because I don't know what it is. I just kind of yeah, have an yeah. idea. And now I see this and I'm like, oh, I know what it is. I you get, pl- oh, I, I see what it, Okay, because I, I get played the idea it, that... Yeah. Yeah, you you feel like you've played it before. You feel like you've been there, done that. Exactly, and that will always be a problem the more we keep going to open world games and why I wish against everything that this next generation people decide that they have to vary the kinds of games that they make so that they don't yeah. feel... Because it's just, gonna kind of, it's just starting to cannibalize each other. Mm-hmm. And um, and it requires them to have like a very specific hook. For my gameplay, I know why I'm getting this, but the fact that it's a samurai game, we don't get many of those... In a while? Hardly any. Hardly any. And if we get them, we get them in the super hard fashion. Like, yeah. <laughs> like Sekiro. <laughs> so, um, so, exactly. <laughs> I have flashbacks when people say that word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why, um, that's the thing that I'm intrigued by. I think the thing that I'm more happy about is the fact that it's a July game and you don't know how we're going to be by the time July rolls around. True. So you always want to have something like that. And I do. I kind of like the double pack that is having Last of Us and Ghost of Tsushima this close to each other, even though I still stand by the fact that the Ghost of Tsushima coming out this close to Last of Us 2 is can is gonna cannibalize it, especially with uh because Last of Us inherently it's always a bigger game. Do you know that when the game went back on sale, it became the number one game on Amazon again, despite the leaks and all of that? Dang. Like Last of Us is huge. And Ghost of Tsushima, it's a new IP. That is always exciting. Unfortunately, when it's a new IP at the end of a console generation and you're releasing the same day now as a Paper Mario game, that's going to be um, going to be interesting for Ghost of Tsushima. I think it's going to be good. I you have what not- I just remembered uh, or imagined this uh, reminds me of Assassin's Creed Rogue, that situation where it was like the new console was coming out. Mm-hmm. And Assassin's Creed Rogue came out just on the 360 and PS3. Uh huh. 
And that's that's exactly what happened. However, we mm. do have we have been confirmed that Ghost of Tsushima is going to be made for the PS5 as well. Uh, it's going to be playable there. That's yeah. all. Yeah. So uh, we still have yet to find out if PlayStation is going to be like, "Hey, we're going to also do the delivery thing." Where if you have oh to- yeah, and uh, yeah, they better fix that because yeah. uh, even Assassin's Creed Valhalla is going to have the Xbox Smart Delivery System. Yeah. If you buy the Xbox One version, you can get the Series X version for free. Uh, then you have people like EA that's sort of getting on that boat that say that you can get the upgrade the EA if you. Show yeah. Up on the next one. No, 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 not, not only that. It's like they said in the inside Xbox that they were going to be part of the smart delivery, and then they released a press release with a lot of butts. Oh. Like, like, yeah, we're doing smart delivery, but only if you buy the Xbox One version before oh, December. Whereas uh, the other smart deliveries, no, you buy it once, you have it. I have to believe that they understand that Microsoft is stacking it this way, that they have to do something similar. Like, yeah. there is a, like they're going to look foolish if then they're like, we have a PS5 version of Ghost of Tsushima. You have to buy it also. That's going to be real bad. That's going to be catastrophic. Just as catastrophic as, as the backwards compatibility snafu that they did at the beginning, that they had to like issue two press releases to fix. Mm-hmm. So, where right now they say that right now they're expecting all the majority of the four thousand games on PS4 to work on the uh, on the PS5, and only the hundred most popular are the ones that are getting PS5 enhancements. Then everything else is gonna run in their PS4 Pro or legacy modes. But that's what happens when you don't get your messaging right at the first time. But yeah, uh, I also feel visually this game. It sucks that it came out the day after the Unreal Engine Five reveal. Do you feel? Yeah. Because I'll say this, because this was a stream, uh, this was a compressed stream. Every compressed stream is going to make the game look a little grimier than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Then when you actually look the actual feed and like high resolution, all that, you see something different. Uh, At the same time, what a benefit this would have been if this had come out yesterday and then the Unreal Engine 5 thing come out today. Because yeah, so if people hadn't, you're saying, um, mm-hmm. if people hadn't seen how good it's about to get, yeah, that would have felt sweeter. I could see that exactly. Yeah, it's only that, but I still say, uh, I feel Ghost of Tsushima feels like a decent enough way for the PS4 to go out, yeah, like that's the last game confirmed that's, that's game, like the final swan song of the PS4 mm-hmm. before the next real step up, I guess, exactly. So so when you consider these two things, um, at the very least, for people that are still on a PlayStation that want an exclusive to play, I'm glad that we still have for this summer both Last of Us and that and this one. And we know Last of Us is not going to be an open world game. It's going to be a wide linear game in the style that, my, that Naughty Dog makes. So they're basically two different um, flavors that they're going to be serving. So... <laughs> Again, I, I'm excited for the setting. I'm not excited for the open world game. That's kind of how I like <laughs> what, what it what it hit me when I watched this. But still, it's cool. I'm not gonna deny it. And we are gonna be looking up to it. Uh, what was it that Palpatine said? We'll be looking at your ca- ca- career well, with, yeah, great with great curiosity. Yeah, I'll say this: that I feel like uh, Sucker Punch has always been in the verge of greatness, but people mm. never considered them like super super top tier they always get there but not quite there yeah. they uh gorilla was like that with horizon i, I mean with Kilson. they were yeah yeah but not quite there and then horizon they put them on the there, map but yeah but then horizon's the one that put them on the map mm-hmm. uh i'm hoping I... that this becomes like a series and they get to like really dial it in on the ps5 can you imagine just like yeah. consolidating just really distilling that idea um, I'd really love that. Right now, uh, the PS5 is exciting in itself just because it may have sequels to Horizon for God of War and Spider-Man. So if this one turns out really good, like a sequel like that of that, it's enough to like justify that system. So mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. Like, uh, I'm glad we're still getting the game. Like, because I was oh, yeah. I was afraid that it was also gonna suffer Dude, the indefinite delay. I was delay. worried it wasn't coming until like next year at the earliest, honestly. Hey, we were at a point where we we're like there Final Fantasy Seven will literally be the last thing we get yep. in twenty in twenty twenty. And there was a point where I was thinking that might honestly be it. <laughs> yeah. Well actually and, and 
And the thing is that the reality is for some things, that's how it's going to be. And there's something I want to talk about real quick. And um, that's not in the gaming related, but it's actually TV related because of the realities of what it's going to happen. So, Paul, press X for x real. Oh, yeah. We haven't done X Reel in a while, but we haven't done the show in a while either. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But even before that, we didn't really do an X Reel section there. Yeah. Um. So obviously coronavirus is just the thing that keeps on wrecking everything. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're a fan of network TV, like knowing that whenever the fall rolls over, there's going to be your returning shows or maybe a new show that may get you hooked. Who knows? Uh, Coronavirus has disrupted everything to such a degree that the next seasons of most TV shows are starting until January. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had to process that for a second. Yeah. So, literally, uh, like, for example, uh, the CW and Fox uh, revealed their schedules um, this week. And they're literally what they're stacking for this fall are like shows that were canceled. Like, in the case of the CW, they bought shows that got canceled from other networks uh, to air like aired seasons in, in its place. And then Fox is like just relying on animation because people can work from home or like reality TV shows that can work with social distancing things. And some shows that they had in the can because they filled them like a year or two ago and they were just waiting to put them in. They usually wait for the summer to like put those kind of shows. So they have some programming uh, in the summer Um, this time, like because right now, like. A lot of people know that, uh, or they don't know, some of these shows like filming in places like Atlanta or Vancouver, mostly Van- Vancouver especially, is where a lot of shows get filmed. Stranger Things is filmed there. My fav- my DC shows that I like watching, they're filmed up there also. Uh, but because people don't know yet when it'll be safe to like go back to work, when it will be safe to like resume all prep, because remember, Productions like this always have hundreds of people close to each other because it's the different devar- departments working in tandem, like setup, teardowns, uh, costume, uh, set designers, all of that, like ADs, assistant directors, directors, all of that. Line. And because social distancing is still a thing that they have to like work around with, uh, they still don't know when filming will resume. And usually if you want a show to debut on September or October, you have to start filming on June or July. And they still are not starting to film that. So instead of trying to cut it close and hoping, maybe things will be open by then. Maybe uh, we'll have it figured out. They were like, screw it. New season start until January. That uh, like, Jeez. And if that's what Fox and the CW did, expect that to happen to NBC, expect that to happen to CBS, to ABC, all of that, like, unless they they have shows in the can that they filmed before everything shut down, it's just not gonna happen. And when what sucks, especially for me, like in the shows that I watch, uh, like for example, The Flash uh, ended this week. Uh, it's sixth season. They ended with nineteen episodes of a planned twenty-two episode season. They shut down production back in March, and they were hoping that things were gonna be solved so that they can come back and film the final three episodes to complete their sixth season. Instead, they, the things they didn't get good. They straight up canceled the rest of the season and oh made and, and made the 19th episode, their finale, which actually worked as a finale, which it's a luxury. Really? Not many people. Yeah. It, it, it was cliffhangery. It, it's kind of like one of those like cliffhangery episodes that you get when a season's almost over. Right. So, so they got lucky. Oh, shoot. I'm glad that it, it really like tied up. Cause usually you're in the middle of, it didn't like tie up anything. It, no, no, it didn't tie here's the thing. It didn't tie up anything, but it ended in the kind of cliffhanger that you can get away with in a season finale that brings you back the next year. Right. So, yeah. Like yeah. for a show like the CW shows, that would work. Mm-hmm. But um like with the promise of, hey, you find out next time on uh-huh. whatever, but at least it's not like in the middle of something happening and mm-hmm. then it cuts. Oh like yeah, the Sopranos. Or oh yeah, it literally, it could. That's kind of kind of feels. Or 
you could be the sorry you, you could be the sorry state of affairs like a show like supernatural where they were in the middle of their final season and they had two episodes left to film that they were not able to film because of coronavirus shutdowns but what the cw is doing with them is that um this is a final season is going to be spread over two seasons which is hilarious to me but like on the fall because they had five because they they aired 15 episodes there's 22 that was going to be the final season they completed five they only have to film two more they're going to add air those as like an original scripted show in the fall and that'll be like the only thing for the cw like that's like quote unquote original content for them because then the rest of their shows even shows that they picked up like superman and lois which was going to be their new superman show that's oh, until yeah. jan that's going to be until january uh, you made me excited for that because I love me some Superman. And when you told me there was going to be an actual Superman show they were yeah. making, I went, oh, baby, let's do this. Exactly. Yeah. Especially because right now Supergirl is winding down. It feels like this is where everything's going to go now. And he is a really good Superman. Uh, the guy that they got for the current CW Superman, uh, Tyler Hecklin, who actually boys Sephiroth in Final Fantasy VII Remake, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is funny. Um so yeah, that that was like the big show for the fall. That's until January now. So, but what sucks now is that for anyone that watches those shows and those season finales are happening on May. Now we have to wait until January. That's seven months of waiting. <laughs> and uh, I sort of, it's a good thing that I became a fan of Game of Thrones when I did back in the day because <laughs> uh, after season seven, remember that was a full year. Yeah. And, that was a and lot it's... of time, and I got into it. I think in the at the beginning of season six. Yeah, uh, same here. Same here. Masters. Here, here. Yeah, you no. Know, I actually at the beginning of season six. I leading like I I watched that entire season, but that's when I got into it myself. I followed the show uh, through reviews and the conversation because I didn't have HBO. Then when HBO now happened, I finally was able to finally caught up on the entire series and watch season six as it was happening. So yeah, exactly. and then and then season seven happened and then they delayed the final season because they needed extra time to work on the battles. They and should have used- like, hey, turn up, do your thing. Yeah. And you know what should have happened. They should have taken the time to write better. <laughs> well, both that and there's a lot of issues actually. You can't I can't start a sentence like that. Um <laughs> they should have spread out most of the season during the course of that final battle. Mm -hmm. where it's like happening and then there's other things going on during this massive like siege battle Mm -hmm. while it's happening even just like you don't even have to put it on the screen like have it going on in the background you have some noises happening like hey there's a dude he just got hit by an ice bolt okay we're continuing with the plot over here um but like that's something that i realized um like for instance with the full metal alchemist brotherhood that i'm watching like we're Mm -hmm. in the final arc of everything and the last season is over one day in this massive massive battle that is going throughout the city i was like wouldn't that have been amazing for game of thrones to end with like during this huge war that's actually happening if they actually had done season eight with the 10 episodes as they were doing with the first six seasons Mm -hmm. and if the and if the showrunners weren't so burnt out and so ready to dip to go work Mm -hmm. on star wars where they're no longer working on star wars yep they uh, they got what they deserved exactly that's that's what that to me is the most hilarious thing that the reason why game of thrones got legitimately royally screwed was because you had guys at the top that were burnt out they didn't want it to do because you have to also give them a little bit of rope because filming that show it's known to be a calamity of stress Mm -hmm. of like a huge huge undertaking because of this kind of scale that they were working on the fact that they were able to do 10 episodes a year of that was still pretty impressive Um, but if you were really not feeling it why not have someone else take the rein, especially when exactly or help? But because they wanted to end it on their terms, the fact is that they did the rush out. And what's funny is that we're literally five days away from the series finale anniversary. Have you literally wow. heard anyone talk about? Hey, remember when Game of Thrones season eight started? Hey, remember when the when the Battle of Winterfell started? There's it's no came- rewatching for that show. No, there literally isn't, and the conversation completely died. Like, mm-hmm. like, um, I, I find funny that so many like when 
Endgame's anniversary came out, how many people were like sharing the the movie oh, yeah. theater experiences again? Like and almost I, daily, I'll see some kind of Avengers meme or somebody mentioning it or talking about avengers in general it's yeah. marvel because dude. that's immortalized now ah, dude yeah, yeah, let me put it this way if freaking shadow hunters which ended on may 6 2019 has like a lot of people celebrating that show's ending and that only lasted three seasons and not even freaking game of thrones have anyone like even muster a desire to even talk about the about the fight you know things got real screwed <laughs> like, like, like and it's oh, yeah. it, it still astonishes me a year later and probably it, because i I reviewed I reviewed that final season. Like I reviewed it. Yeah, I and that. and I gave a positive review to the series finale. I've never regretted a review more in my life. <laughs> Ever. Because you know what happened? I read the spoilers heading into it. So uh, I had already okay. processed the big you thing. Prepared. Yeah, I was prepared. So when I got to see it, I was like, this wasn't that bad. I am, I think I liked it, especially because I hated episodes yeah. four and five. Well, mm-hmm. I yeah, because episode three, the Battle of Winterfell disappointed me. I was like, oh, man, right. I was looking so forward to this. And the more I kept thinking about it, I was like, man, they really screwed up, didn't they? And then episode four um, was like a complete like rush mess. I was like, what's happening here? It's like, and then episode five completely jumped the shark with the Danny turn and uh, completely unearned turn. But then by the time episode six arrived, I didn't mind it. You're reading the spoilers and seeing how it exits, but then when I really thought about it, had I really experienced it the way it was intended to be experienced, I probably would have been even more negative towards it because I know my opinion completely turned on that. Kind of like uh, I mentioned at the top of the show how my opinions of Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker turned, uh, and I can elaborate with that so we don't have to like do that again. Uh, I feel like why my opinions have turned on those movies is just knowing that there was no vision. Like there was like no coherent vision for a trilogy. It was uh, two directors with uh, with a dick measuring contest. Uh, One wanting to take the story his own way and wanting to like do that to prove why things in Star Wars were wrong and why needed to be subverted and all of that just to see, just to feel clever. And the funny thing is that I kind of bought the hype, especially because a lot of reviews were positive of like, oh man, it's so good because it subverts expectations. <laughs> and Sound familiar? Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. So I, it made me realize that subverting expectations is not necessarily a good thing. For the sake of it, for the sake, no, for, for, yeah. for the sake of it, then you have something like Rise of Skywalker that was born out of the discourse around that yeah. movie to try and to discord, fix it, almost. and yeah, the discourse and discord towards that movie mm-hmm. uh, that decided to cram two movies into one that is just like completely breathless p- paced thing that is very entertaining. The thing because that that's what I was like realizing yeah. when. I, I did like, enjoy the the following along with the movements of mm-hmm. the plot crazy exactly. enough. No, because the things that that movie is designed for you to like move as fast as humanly possible mm-hmm. for you to not think about it. Stop to think about it and it's a complete disaster. It falls apart. Yeah. It, 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 really, it, really, it really falls apart. And like, then Rise of, and then uh, Rise of Skywalker yeah. wasn't helped by the fact that then they kept explaining stuff after the fact. How like... Um, how like Ray's father was like a clone of Palpatine. They they had to like do a bunch of explanation. Uh, well, well, well. Of course, this would happen. So um, Paul's internet decided to die on him. It probably got nuked out in a nuclear apocalypse because, of course, we live in the apocalypse in these days. So um, I guess that will do it for this week's episode of the X Button. So. I just want to thank all of you for listening to us for close to two hours. I would hope you did and that you had fun and we will see you next week and we'll, you will see a couple new stuff that we're going to be trying. So I wish you all well and I hope you have a safe and wonderful day or weekend or whenever you're listening to this. My name is Alejandro and don't forget, press X to play.